Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to start uh, today's discussion. Um, what's the ticket? Um, th this conversation started when I talked to um, Heather uh, uh, last year about uh, my role when I come to the, 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 the um, Documentary Film Festival. I'm the senior executive at the um, uh, BFI Film Fund, and we can fund about 20 or so projects a year, but that's across the board, dramatic and uh, non-fiction, um, sorry, dramatic um, and, and documentary. Um, and the question that constantly I have to ask um, when people come to us with documentaries is, what makes it theatrical? Because the lottery money that we, we, we um, administrate has to have that theatrical um, element to it. And it's a question I ask of myself, I ask of the filmmakers I talk to, and I thought what a great opportunity on this panel discussion to, to talk to people who have excelled um, in their various ways with theatrical documentary, whether as distributors, as directors, or producers, and to kind of way to flush out that question, what makes a documentary theatrical, um, and when it works. Um, very briefly, a little housekeeping thing, um, phones off and all that thing. I've got my phone here. If it looks like I'm reading it, it's because I've got my notes on it, so I, I apologise. It's, it's, it's not because I'm checking my text or anything like as disastrous as that. Um, the other thing is, if we're going to have Q&A at the end um, to, the, to, to the panel, and uh, if you can wait till the um, mic's handed to you, because that makes it obviously, I think, easier um, to, to, uh, to hear. I'm going to quickly introduce the panel, and then um, we'll sort of get into the, the, the um, meat and potatoes of it. But I suppose... Just again on a personal level, um, what, what excites me when I go to a cinema is the sense of being in a cathedral, being in a space, being in a, in a community watching things. And I can think of some great moments I've had watching documentaries, obviously the work, the people around the table, but I, I think about what got me into cinema, whether it was Gimme Shelter or Thin Blue Line, or probably one of the first things I ever saw that would be described as a documentary when I was 13, I went on a school trip to see Night and Fog, and most harrowing pieces of footage you could probably ever see, but I'm really pleased I saw it in the context of a cinema with a group of people, and I felt, you know, that to me showed me the power of imagery and the power of image, imagery to watch collectively. So in a way, those, these are the kind of themes that I want to, sort of, you know, to, to, to flesh out. What, what gives you that awe? What gives you that space, the cathedral space, when we still now are watching things on all different ways, there's still that need to watch it in a big, a big, sort of a big screen. Um, anyway, introductions. First of all, we have um, to my very left, um, Simon Chin, who's here with The Imposter and also um, Searching for Sugar Man, which went down so well as the opening night movie last night. Um, Simon's also produced Man on Wire and a range of other extraordinary films um, and re knows what it is to take a, a documentary to theatrical uh, scale. Carol Morley on my left, me left, uh, directed uh, Dreams of the Life, um, which wonderful film that we have a vested interest in as a BFI <laughs> film fund, we put money into it, but again, a film that I really felt had to be told on the big screen, as obviously Carol did, and I'm sure she'll talk a bit about her experience of making it. Um, here we have um, Ollie Harbottle from Dogwoof, who is one of, I think, you know, the great distributors, who's, you, you're, you're, in a way, your, your model is about taking documentary to, to big screen. I mean, you, you, you're, you're moving into fiction as well, but primarily for you it's about documentary. Yep. And to uh, my uh, uh, very far right, um, we have um, John Batsick, again, award-winning documentary producer, um, who has worked on many brilliant things. Kevin McDonald's Oscar-winning uh, One Day in September, probably being, um, uh, you know, again, one of the great examples of theatrical, but also your exec on The Imposter and Searching for Sugar Man as well. So uh, I think some pretty, pretty impressive um, expertise in this, in this room. And I suppose a way I kind of want to, again, excuse me, because I am I'm very focal, I'm going to do this a lot, but... Um, for you, Carol, you know, when you sort of wanted to think about making dreams of a life, why for you was it something that you had to tell on the big screen, come what may? I actually had a flashback before when you said about always asking filmmakers about whether it was a theatrical documentary, because I remember you asking it. You actually didn't ask me that. You said, why is it not television? And, um, and I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember saying, because I don't make television. I mean, that, that, I remember that reply, but I think for me it's kind of... With Dreams of Life, it was the scope that a theatrical experience can afford. You know, I don't want to get in too much comparing it to television, but there, 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 I think television has become 
for documentary, a place where there's real kind of format has taken place, I think. And it's very difficult to experiment within the kind of commissions that take place. So for me, I had a very, very particular way I wanted to make the film. Uh, that, for, yeah, for me was cinematic. It was about using music and song and experimenting with form, of, of not explaining things, of asking a lot of questions. Um, so I, I always saw it in my head as, as being something you would see in a darkened room and, and begin to experience, you know, because it's about a woman that lay dead for three years, uh, 38 before anyone discovered her. Um, just to take people along that experience in a way that they had to partake of it. It didn't have commercial breaks or it didn't, it wasn't small screen, you had to become emerged in it. Uh, and that was sort of very important to me. And in fact, I could have made it a lot sooner as a television piece because the story was sort of quite powerful, but we, we, did, re we did resist that. And I wanted more money. I wanted money to clear music, which costs a lot, a lot you know, and to, to have that scope. So it's sort of lots of different reasons, but you know. And I suppose quickly, also for you, when you go to see a, a documentary in the cinema, what, what are the words that are important to you? What, what are you looking for when you're going to see something big screen? Well, I mean, obviously, with you know, man on wire, they're you know, uh, touching the void, all those stories. They're quite, they they are epic. They're epic stories, but they're also very personal stories, and they and they draw you in. I think they are very powerful in that that they become sort of uniquely exposing some inner life. Whereas a lot of factual stuff on television becomes a general overview of something. So for me, I look to take me as an audience member on that on that journey through that landscape and, 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 and a very directed, authored piece that, you know, where somebody's really thought about that experience. You know, like, like um, you know, Man on Wire, the heist movie, isn't it? It's like, you know, deals with genre. You know, it's a genre movie, really, but... So. <coughs> and Simon, for you then, when you, when you, when you approach stories, when you, when you go and see films in the cinema, when you're thinking about what you want to produce next, what, again, what are the things that you're looking for in, in terms of that thing that you know, that magic thing that will make it a theatrical documentary? I, I, I guess it's just an incredibly difficult question, and I guess it's, 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 <laughs> it's very personal to, yeah. to all of us. I, I don't think there's, there's sort of one thing that, that I could identify that I, I go for. I guess I just respond to stories and things, and, you know, narratives and, you know, ask the question of whether they will sustain, you know, 90 minutes, whether they, whether they have the kind of visual possibilities and whether, I guess, also they have a sort of an, another sort of dimension, whether sort of through the telling of the story, you know, they generate bigger ideas, whether they resonate with audiences. And I, I get man on white, so it felt to me when I came across it like it had, it had all those kind of narrative elements, it had all those visual possibilities, um, but it had this kind of other dimension that, you know, an audience, a modern audience, experiencing this story from a, sort of the perspective of today, um, you know, could, would experience it in a very, very different way from an audience pre-9-11, and that felt extraordinary to me, actually. Um, it wasn't always actually that easy convincing others, um, uh, but I, I, you know, actually you know, bringing a director like James Marsh on board and, and the vision that he could kind of bring to bear on that story, um, yeah, I think I think really kind of accelerated it and made and, and made all those possibilities very very real. And John, again, as a producer looking at stories that you think, okay, this is something I want to go out and make a feature film rather than a TV piece. What what are the Again, what are the things you're looking for in a very basic way? I mean, I think in a very basic way, you're sort of looking for a story that feels like it can sort of transcend the, the core part of that story. In other words, a story that, as Simon said, can, can resonate on, on different levels and also that has the ability to be told from a visual point of view cinematically. So something that you, know, you can treat in a way that, that ultimately feels like you're making a piece of cinema. So, so yeah, I think, I think, as Simon says, story, story is obviously key, and, 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 and then the, getting a sense of whether, it, whether the film is greater than the sum of its parts, whether it isn't just one story, it's a story that can resonate on many levels, that means that it feels like it can appeal to a broad audience. And Ollie, you've, from the sort of 
you know, I suppose the industrial side of it. You, as a distributor, you've distributed um, you know, Dreams of Life, but also Age of Stupid, yeah. and End of the Line, more campaigning documentaries. But, and then for you, when you're looking at documentaries that you know you can make something of beyond just the specialised screenings, you can take to the picture house and take to the Curzon, what, what, what is it that sort of, you know, you, you can pick out? Um, I mean, I think there's kind of been two phases with the films we put out at Dogwoof. I mean, in 2009, when we really kind of moved into the documentary market, it, it, there was a zeitgeist for big campaigning documentaries. There was The Age of Stupid, The End of the Line. And they were kind of fresh at that time. I think uh, since that year, it's probably been a little bit saturated in terms of social issue documentaries. But at, at that time, it was very exciting in the world of kind of social media um, campaigning films, building big, big campaigns from the beginning of the film's uh, life and then bringing that into the cinema. I think since that year, we've seen a real shift in, um, in the documentaries coming, uh, coming to us. And I think documentary filmmakers are just adopting more creative approaches, um, both in terms of like the, the style that they're using in terms of the film, but also the stories. And I think Dreams of a Life was actually the first film that we ever took on um, at kind of treatment stage. And um, having met Carol, having seen her previous work, and just seeing the, the treatment she had in mind, it just competed with a narrative feature film. And I think audiences, having kind of become slightly more open-minded to documentaries in the cinema, are now kind of seeing that documentaries can compete with narrative features in terms of just good stories. And I remember when we did Dreams of a Life, I mean, you can just pitch it as a kind of high concept. Have you seen a film about the woman who died and wasn't found for three years? And that, that competes with a good narrative feature. So that was what we noticed. I think it's interesting how you say you, you can pitch it, because actually I realised we should have shown right at the beginning. I want to show you a couple of trailers, because in a way, when you're looking at projects, when, when people are assessing projects from a sales point of view or distribution point of view, usually the thing you hear is, can you could cut a good trailer out of it? And is it something that is a high concept? Yeah. Um, we're all going to have to duck down, because I think we've got a screen behind us. But um, I asked for us to, to, to screen um, Senna, which um, I suppose was one of the big hits of last year. And I think that's something, again, that you, you, you watch the trailer and would also not watch the trailer for The Imposter. And you kind of know that you're, you're going to grab, grab audiences straight into that. You, you know that it's something you could, you could watch on the big screen. So let's all dip down and we can watch Senna and then The Imposter. Oh, really? We've got, okay. we've got that. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I was told we did that. Okay. <laughs> Seventy-eight. I came to Europe to compete for the first time. It was pure driving. It was real racing, and that that makes me happy. among the all-time greats. How do you feel about being world champion? It's not a bad feeling at all, is it? <laughs> Edson has a small problem. He thinks that he can't kill himself. And I think that's very dangerous. We are competing to win. And if you no longer go for a gap, you're no longer a racing driver. I was treated like a criminal. The best decision is my decision. I can't stand this. Walking away from the dark forces just doesn't become an option. I was not going to give up. So have any of your girlfriends ever asked you to go faster? Ja. <laughs> there was an energy, a force, a spirit. It was electrifying. the last time either of them would be on the podium. Ayrton ran out of luck. There is a lot to go, a lot to learn, a lot to do. But I have plenty of time. Pure driving. Real racing. 
That makes me happy. Well, that was Sana. Um, we could go straight into looking at the, the trailer of The Imposter as well, because I want to ask Simon, when he, when he first started working on The Imposter, did you ever think it was just going to be TV, or did you go, no, this has to be big screen? Again, it's back to the, the high concept. Can you cut it in a, you know, three minutes? Shall I answer that now, or I'll throw Shall it Shall we watch the trailer of The Imposter as well? The birthday girl, isn't she beautiful? And here is her brother, Nick. The thought of what somebody could have done to him, it gives you nightmares. get him and get him back here where he's safe. I didn't see how I could not document him as a U.S. citizen. We had no idea what kind of person we were getting. They look very different. He disappeared without a trace three years ago. Tonight, a San Antonio boy is back home. When a child is missing for years, either the child is dead or the child is not found. He was tortured. I mean, he had torture written on. This kid's really messed up. There was just something wrong about it. Something was being hidden, and I didn't know what that was. The FBI is not taking this case lightly. There was something going on more than meets the eye, of course. He couldn't speak English without an accent. Maybe he's not Nicholas Barkley. He cannot be an American. We didn't need to prove who he was. This is their family member. I mean, no one would be wrong about something like that. Wait a minute. What has he done? This is a very dangerous person. A story so bizarre, it's hard to believe it's true. F him. Just you in my home, you rascal, you. I can't imagine it being for, for TV at all. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that trailer's obviously the, the end of a kind of long process, but I guess at the outset, John, John and I were asked to come on board uh, this project uh, as executive producers by Bart Leighton, the director, and Dimitri Deganis, the producer who, are, who own and run a company called Raw, which is a television production company, <laughs> and they were very determined that this was to, to be, you know, their first theatrical feature doc, and they went, they, that was the, their explicit ambition uh, at the outset. That's why they kind of asked John and I to get involved. Um, and I guess, yeah, we, we were kind of, didn't take us that long, because the story is so extraordinary. That it's an un, literally unbelievable story, but a story with huge sort of narrative reversals, with kind of great, which sort of offered up sort of great possibilities to sort of treat documentary as sort of thriller, as a sort of genre, uh, to, to kind of use, to use reenactment in, in a way that sort of nudged the form a bit further than anything that, previously, that had previously been done. And it was, that was all to do with Bart, actually. Bart Layton, the director, and his vision. Uh, Bart has, I think, created Banged Up Abroad, which many of you will know, sort of popular television series. Um, and although, you know, the resources, those are cheap and cheerful in many ways, what they actually demonstrate and what he, is, is the uh, kind of narrative abilities uh, that he, he would have needed to bring to bear to this. And he's sort of done that in abundance, but, but what he's also done is he's, he's raised his game hugely, visually, uh, and in so many other ways to make this a piece of cinema. Um, I don't know whether John would agree with all that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd agree with that. I, I, I also think that I, it was very clear to me, and I think Simon would probably agree, that, that making these films is also about the people who are trying to make them. And Dimitri and Bart were instantly 
utterly convincing, but had a very clear vision. You just had a sense that these were people who, yeah, they might have needed, they might need a certain amount of guidance from us, but they, there was, he had a very clear vision of what he was trying to do. So, you know, they, they ran a very successful company. Dimitri's a very proficient, talented producer, and I think, I, I certainly felt that, you know, w one of the great things about Docs is it's a collabor uh, feature Docs is it's a collaboration between a sort of the, the inner circle of people, and I felt like Bart and Dimitri were, were definitely people with whom we would be able to work and who had their vision kind of mapped out in their heads, and, and that made our job that much easier, I think. But they, they very much wanted, to, they went in knowing that they wanted to raise, you know, a significant budget, you know, a million quid, um, which for Doc is significant, um, still a stretch for everything that they've pulled off, actually. Uh, and the, the ambition, that's kind of what you want to hear in a way, that the ambition from the outset is not, uh, we want to make a tech piece of television that maybe could be, a theat could be theatrical at the end if we get it right. It's, it's going in with that ambition at the outset and that in everything you do, in your, your approach to the whole thing, you're, you're trying to think, this is, this is a movie, you want to engage a cinema audience, uh, you want to fill a big screen, both sort of aesthetically and narratively, and that was clearly their ambition with this. And Carol, you mentioned earlier that actually the, sort of in the way that it's the production values, it's the music, all those things that you think about when you're making a feature film that were important to you to make it to a big screen. Yeah, I mean, I saw The Imposter. Weirdly enough, it, what Dreams of Life and The Imposter shows is the interviews were shot by Linda Hall in both... Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a weird. But I saw The Imposter in, in America, and it was, it was just so exciting to see kind of British. I mean, obviously, it's an American story, but British documentary being so sort of, I don't know, forward, you know, because often it's been the American documentaries that have influenced after the whole Greer's and things. So it's, it, was, it was really exciting to see it. Uh, but I think that's it. it, you know, it do, you know, at the end of the day, the different, you know, one of the basic differences is money, because if you go to television, you will get significantly less money to, to kind of create a kind of cinematic experience and have your Dolby and have your music and whatever and get worldwide clearance, which, the, I mean, the, the budget for Dreams of Life was 500,000 and the music clearance was 50,000. Mm -hmm. So it's like a significant part of it. And again, as both John and Simon, because you had already produced Oscar-winning doc British documentaries yeah. and you'd raised the game in a way for, I suppose, that, that expectation of, again, production values, gloss, that's all, all the things that you are looking for when you go to the cinema. Um, but when you set out, you know, that, we, we just talked about the impossible, but when you set out the one day in September and with Man and War, again, it, it, they were films, they were films, weren't they? Well, in your actually, head? one day in September was sort of a seminal moment for me, actually, because, you know, here was a, a documentary that in every respect kind of felt like it was pushing every aspect of the form to create a sort of theatrical experience in the, in the cutting, in the, the use of music, you know, in the kind of the narrative scope, in the sort of the big themes and ideas that sort of exposed and made available. You know, and that, that was, blew me away, and that's what made me want to, to do this. So, but I, do, I just want to say something because I also think that I would go to the cinema to see something that was shot on VHS if it's a brilliant story. So I don't want to confuse, you know, I don't want to confuse this yeah. idea well, that it's about that. Searching for Sugar Man, which yeah. is what we have but here, I is think not I the most polished. Yeah, and yeah, no. So, it's but I think, heart, I think what it is as well is that when you sort of go into that world, I mean. Ollie will testify to this, that, you know, the thing that when you want to make these kind of films because you want to make, tell a story in a different way than television, the thing that everyone is asking you is who's going to distribute it, who will put it on in these cinemas that you kind of imagine in your head, and that's so important. So really the fact that Dog Wolf can, can get films into cinemas and out there in this really unique way is brilliant for all documentary filmmakers. Can I, let me just quickly say, I, I think the most encouraging thing about the One Day in September experience which was the first documentary, feature documentary I ever made, is that I had no idea what I was doing. I, I, I mean, insofar as it wasn't, a, you know, my game plan with Kevin McDonald, who I'd befriended over a period of years, um, was just that we wanted to set out to make this story in as cinematic a way as we possibly could. We didn't know at the outset that it was going to work. We didn't know it was going to play out the way it did. And, and from my perspective, I'd never made a documentary before. We just had an ambition, put our heads down, and went for it, and, and discovered through the journey that the story had the legs 
to be able to be told that way, and obviously Kevin had the talent to tell it that way, and Justine Wright, who cut it, has gone on to become an incredibly successful documentary and movie editor, also had the talent to be able to tell it the way we were wanting to tell it. But it was, it was having a sense, just a sense that this was a story that had that ability I was talking about to transcend. If we got it right, it wasn't just a story about athletes getting killed at the Olympics. It was a much bigger story than that. We had our sort of cinematic ambition. We were slightly flying blind, but we, but we just went for it. And it wasn't until well into the process when we were looking at assemblies. And actually, the first assembly I remember really well, because I, I'd, I'd previously made a movie, which, which when, when I watched the first assembly, I wanted to top myself. And when I watched the assembly of, of one day in September, the first assembly, I sat, I watched the film, came out of it, and thought, God, we've done, I've done it again. It's just, this film is not going to work. And yet, you know, we, we carried on. We worked away and away with the edit, kept editing, kept working hard, kept shooting till well late, late into the schedule and, you know, sticking to our guns and to that ambition, it ended up as a piece of cinema. It's, to me, again, just as an audience member, it's about deep immersion. And I suppose it's interesting, Ollie, that, you know, Dreams of Life was the first time you read a treatment and thought, yeah, I know that can bring the deep immersion experience that you need to go into a cinema and pay money to see a film rather than watching it on any of the evenings you can. Are you look, you're looking at things now, are there other things that you could perhaps talk about? Was there an example of something you read as a treatment who thought, yeah, actually, I can go on this journey, I want to be the distributor of this film and I can make a decision on a piece of paper? Um, I mean, was, we are now more open to looking at films much earlier stage. I mean, I think the point with Carol's story, I, I just think that there has been, I think Man and Wire for me really was the game changer. I mean, coming into documentaries a little bit later than the people at this table, I mean, when I was kind of 10 years ago entering the industry, kind of Morgan Spurlock and Michael Moore, they, I mean, they were the big cinema documentaries. And there was this, this new golden age, but it was very much kind of still that kind of traditional didactic opinion kind of issue-led documentary. Then when Man, Man on Wire came along and it's this kind of high concept that's tapping into a genre, I mean, all these great films that we're talking about, for me, what, what you've seen is that there's a lack of originality coming out of fiction film in Hollywood. And all these films could very, very easily be made as fiction films thereafter. So I think in real life, there are the most exciting, interesting, unique ideas. And um, I think game changers like Man and Wire have kind of opened our eyes as audiences, but also as distributors and as producers um, for this kind of this idea. And I think the fact that Universal working title, kind of known for Richard Curtis, decided to do a documentary, I mean, uh, it's still a big budget, but I think that's a real sign of kind of Documentaries really, they're just competing with feature films. And so for us now, we are, we are talking to filmmakers earlier. We are looking at their creative approaches. And um, yeah, I think it's very exciting times. Um, Simon, do you feel the landscape's changing for financing of <coughs> documentaries that have you know, theatrical ambition? Is it changing? Um, I mean, yeah. and, and how are you, how are you it's, putting together? It's, it's actually really tough. <laughs> I mean, the truth is there are opportunities out there to make theatrical feature docs, but they're, they're narrow. Uh, and they're narrow for, I guess, good reason. It's, it's a shame that, in a way, I think sometimes I sort of feel that audiences need to be, mainstream audiences don't need to be educated, that documentaries can sort of deliver emotion, you know, uh, can deliver narrative. The fact that narrative, the, the term narrative film is, 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 is a term that's used specifically for fiction, um, I sort of, I, I feel it's sort of indicative of, of the problem. Actually, narrative docs can deliver narrative like like no other at their at their best. Um, I guess there was a point at which the market is quite sort of saturated, and maybe it it, it, it is just that there are only a small handful of, of docs that sort of succeed every year. But I guess I wish there were more, and I think that's partly to do that. The more good docs that that succeed, I guess the more Filmmakers will have the ambition, the more people will come to them, and I guess it will hopefully it'll work like that. It's probably a good time to bring up some stats that we have um, on a box office and documentary, which um, is, I think, very um, exciting stats, uh, just in terms of, of how things are progressing. If you look, um, these are documentaries that doesn't take, in, doesn't take into account music stuff, which music documentaries like Justin Bieber, whatever, do have spiked some of the... Uh, the um, results, but these are, are stripped free of, 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 of those all condensed. But if you look at, you know, 2011, um, that's 
it's, it's, kind of, it's pretty healthy. I mean, obviously, there's certain documentaries we could, I mean, Senna obviously probably contributed to that, but um, I think we're showing, it, it's showing audiences are, are not, they're at the point where now that, that division between drama and, and uh, documentary is beginning to be sort of more blurry and people yeah. are going, wanting to just see good films. And I mean, I was looking at these figures. Um, in 2001, the total number of documentaries released was four. So I think just the huge increase in the number of documentaries getting out there is it's a very positive sign. So. And John, I mean, for you, the, the roots for financing your films at the moment, you know, again, do you feel it's a, it's a healthier place or? Um, I mean, I, I suppose I feel like we're in a lucky position because <clears throat> partly because we started with one day in September, you know, we've we've always been able to make sort of we've sort of I suppose we've developed a, rela a reputation for making high end, high ish end fe cinema feature docs, and that's meant that the marketplace has always you know when we come when we go out to the marketplace with our budgets, no one's ever done a double take and said are you out of your mind? You, we can't you know they've always there's always there's been a certain expectation that the kind of films we make have a certain budget level, and and the truth is I think through the economic dips, et cetera, et cetera, you know, people still want to make great films. And if you've got a great story, just like I feel like in the feature world, if you've got a great script, you know, if you've got the raw material, there, is a, there are financiers out there who will fund your film. I mean, we, we tend to get a large chunk of our finance out of the US, normally broadcast money, but, but you know, more and more there's equity that, that we're able to bring to the table. Um, and our stories, you know, do tend to be the higher end type of stories, or it's a situation like the Searching for Sugar Man situation, which was a which was a filmmaker who approached Simon, having done a fair amount of the work, and we we sort of approached that process from the opposite end, which is how does one help that person realize their vision, finish financing their film, and get it to the marketplace, where we one hopes that there's the possibility that, that people, the distributors will come in and bid for it and, and you make your money that way. And certainly, Simon particularly hand, uh, held Malik's hand the whole way through that process and it actually worked like a dream, didn't it? I mean, it went it exactly was, the was, way we hoped it would it go. It was a pain in the ass, but it was great fun at the same time. Actually. Yeah. It was one of those projects actually where, and not all of them like this, where you sort of forget the pain and it just feels like a pleasure. Partly because of what has happened to it. It's a project that sort of arrived, you know, in my sort of intray as a sort of small and sort of slightly imperfect project that sort of showed great possibility. We all got very excited about that possibility. And the fact that it is actually now sort of beginning to become actually quite a big project, um, a big film, you know, for a doc, um, feels incredibly gratifying. And a, a first time director who's only ever directed six minute pieces on Swedish television who came across this amazing story and and had a kind of vision for it and worked every minute of every day of four years of his life to, to pull it off. It's, it's, it's sort of the holy grail for, for us, I guess, isn't it? Um, again, I suppose, again, thinking about sort of the, I suppose, the Grierson aspect of documentary and, uh, you know, films perceived to sort of change, change the world. Um, um, and, and are, you know, are they getting the recognition in cinemas that, 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 so I'm going to start over again. Um, do, does a film need to change the world in the way that, again, I suppose, end the line, the sort of that kind of that campaigning documentary, which has, I suppose, also opened up another area of um, of theatrical venture? Or do you feel? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are there is a clear divide in kind of the, the big success stories at, at cinemas in terms of documentaries. There's the one that we've been talking about, and then these big campaigning films. I mean, I do think 2009 was kind of a sweet spot in this, in this type of documentary. I mean, there was The Age of Stupid, which John was actually involved in, um, which was kind of a very unique, exciting, if that's the right word, um, look at kind of the issues of climate change. I mean, An Inconvenient Truth had kind of got the awareness out there, but was a slightly dry documentary in all fairness. Um, but Franny's film kind of employed um, elements of fiction with Pete Postlethwaite and kind of just told it in a much more interesting and accessible way and I think that was a that was a, a game changer in terms of campaigning docs. Very quickly off the back of that was the end of the line which had a lot of kind of high profile celebrity support. Um, big corporations like Waitrose as well as NGOs were kind of really putting their muscle behind it and I think 
suddenly everyone got very excited about that this was the future and documentaries would change the world. I think that probably has caused a few issues in terms of, um, from what I hear from people trying to raise money, that a lot of funding and foundations and grants are kind of now set up for these kind of very social issue-led documentaries. So I think there was perhaps a negative kind of uh, a repercussion of this, but I mean, I think if there's still a great documentary which tells an issue that needs to be told, we'll, we'll happily take it on, and it's not gonna break box office records, but I think there are, there are audiences for these films as well. But I am very conscious that I think there are too many of these films probably being made. John, would you like to add into that as, as your experience of Age of Stupid? Um, and where you'd, what, you'd, what would it take for you to take on something like that now to think, okay, it's, it's theatrical? It would, first of all, take a director and a producer as driven and hardworking as Franny and Lizzie, that's for sure, because those two did an absolutely incredible job on that film. I mean, again, to me, it's about, you know, it's, it's, if it's an issue that I feel strongly about and it's talent that I think we can work with to make it in a way that gives it a shot of finding an audience, then I would always be open to anything. It, it, it's always about how you gravitate to what the subject is that you're trying to deal with. We, all, we were also involved in Jeremy Gillies' film Peace One Day and The Day After Peace. And when Jeremy first came to see me, I, I was just, you know, I was sure I didn't want to do it. But actually, the more he talked to me about what the issue was, the more I shed my cynicism and thought, you know what, this, you can knock it as much as you want, and people do, but the fact is, this is a good thing to do, and it should be made, and we should get it out there, and maybe people will watch it, maybe they won't, but it isn't gonna do any harm, that's for sure. It's only good. I, none of us who made that film, or Age of Stupid, were gonna walk away from it going, oh, well, I wish I hadn't done that. And, and, and what we did was try and make both of them in a way that they could find an audience. So, you know, I'm not looking for those kind of films, but I'm not, lo not looking for those kind of films. It's always about what's the story and how can we make it work. And Dreams of a Life was a story mm. rather than or was it for you a campaign about... <laughs> it wasn't a campaign. Yeah. Maybe a personal campaign to make it. But I, th I think for me, it's, I think the history of cinema, independent cinema has always been a struggle. So that will be... Docu you know, documentary tends to be people that want to tell something different than the mainstream story. So I think there will always be a struggle to it. And I think with Dreams of a Life, I wasn't... S I, it wasn't just about telling the story, which I thought was incredibly important. I thought, I did think it spoke, you know, it spoke so much about, like, modern life, you know, a woman there in London, you know, above a shopping centre for three years and nobody knows she's died. I mean, that, that was just an epic story for me. But for me, it was also equally as important to think about how that story was told. So it wasn't just about telling it. I mean, you know, you know, it wasn't just about showing the story, it's about how do you tell it, how do you tell it? Not for me as a director to, you know, I'm not thinking I want to bring an audience in, but you're thinking of how you can create complexity to that story. And I think that's probably for me, a, you know, to go back earlier to a kind of definition of what cinematic documentary is, I think it's complex, I think it leaves people with a lot of questions, and I think it doesn't pander to an audience, I think it creates space for an audience to kind of come up so no, I, I'm, just, I'm not really a campaigning person <laughs> but although the things I touch on tend to be sort of things that probably are social issue things just you know in that sense of because I'm interested in the dark side of life you know so. and, 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 and Simon for you, for you again is it just story or is it I mean the idea that a film can change the way you think about the world yeah I mean I, I actually I have no confidence that I have any ability whatsoever to change anything about the world. Uh, and it's not what interests me, actually. Um, what interests me, actually, is sort of reflecting the world and in sort of all its kind of murkiness and complexity. Um, and I think, actually, those sort of that, those, uh, that makes for the great, the best films. And documentaries, I think, are often the best way to achieve those things you can actually look into the whites of someone's eyes and it says so much. There's so much complexity in Jean-Louis' tears where he cries at the end of Man on Wire, which you couldn't, no scriptwriter in Hollywood could, could ever write. And, it, and, and I can't even explain to you now. I have lots of ideas about it. And, and those are the films I, I, I want to make. I think um, it's unfortunate in a way because actually there's a lot, many more f f uh, sources of, of, of finance for those who do want their films, their documentaries to change the world, particularly in America. Um, I wish there were more for, for more sources of finance for people who just wanted to tell 
good and complicated stories. And I did actually, on Project NIM, there's a sort of interesting example. Um, Project NIM, which James and I, was a John exec, um, the film we made after, after Man on Wire. Um, and it was a film uh, about a chimpanzee. Many of you may have seen it or know about it. Um, and the attempt to teach him sign language uh, and the cruelty, you know, it was, it's an extraordinary story. Um, and uh, after Man on Wire, we were in a rather kind of rare position of, of having a number of pos financing possibilities. And one of those was a, a, with an American uh, financier, who I probably shouldn't name, but a financier for whose, whose remit, part of whose remit is to, is to make sort of films that have a sort of social action agenda. And they were ready to put down a very significant amount of money, and it was very tempting. And James and I discussed it, and John and I discussed it, and it just didn't feel right, because what they were after was a kind of social action campaign on the back of it that they would want to earmark a certain amount of money for, and which we wouldn't get any ultimate approval over. And going into that film and you know the kind of conversations we were having with the, the interview subjects about our agenda or lack of agenda, our agenda just simply being to tell the story as we see it in all its complexity, just felt sort of deeply uncomfortable. So we turned, we turned the money down. And f fortunately, we got, we got it from somewhere else. I think it was you guys, actually. Um, I suppose one of the crucial questions, we're at a documentary film festival, but for all your films, you, you launched in terms of world premieres at, at sort of festivals that were both uh, documentary and drama. Um, you, I suspect, Oli, go to see, go to all festivals to look, to look for stuff. Um, the, for your for your distribution <coughs> models, but do you think it's important to, and this is a contentious question to say this at, at Sheffield, which I, you know is a great great festival, but is it important for you to platform your films in that space if you want to take it to a theatrical space that's kind of like a Sundance or a South by Southwest or a Toronto, which is about you know the the acquisition market full stop for, you know, for theatrical things. Is it important to launch your yeah. film at one of those? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, actually, all the films that I've, I've done, I've launched at Sundance. Um, and Sundance is an extraordinary place for, for that uh, and for sort of finding dis distributors um, to, 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 to buy your film. Um, you know, it's actually kind of, I think that John would uh, concur with this, it, there, there is no other market quite like Sundance, actually. Um, we've done extraordinary deals uh, because of Sundance and at Sundance and just before Sundance. There's something about the kind of mountain air and the time of year, people go a bit crazy. Um, but, it, but also just in terms of, you know, it is the place where, you know, people come to see, you know, films and, and particularly to see documentaries actually. The, the docs at Sundance are sometimes better than the, the, the fiction yeah. films and, and you know, there you go, what, what, what better I mean, I, I, I saw Searching for Sugarman and the Imposter at uh, Sundance this year at the very beginning of the festival. I think, oh great, this is the, the bar's been set this high. And it was sort of, then I got onto my sort of fiction drag and it all <laughs> sort of slightly slid down after that. But um, I, I, I think, you know, John, I'm sure you're, you know, you're echoing uh, um, Simon, but for Ollie in terms of you're looking at films at all festivals, or do you see, the, again, back to this thing of the kind of films that you're going to take them to a, uh, uh, um, into the theatrical realm. What would you recommend the audience in terms of if they've got a theatrical feature, where should they be launching? Is it something you know, that... Um, I agree. I think it needs to be a broader festival than just documentaries. I mean, documentary festivals play a hugely significant part of my job in, in, in sourcing films, but I think to launch it... I agree, Sundance, uh, Tribeca, South by Southwest. I mean, we launched uh, Dreams of a Life at London, and it was just such a perfect place to launch the film, obviously because it was London, and it's a very London film. Um, but just seeing this broad audience, which, which these kind of mainstream festivals bring, and if a film works at these kind of mainstream festivals, you kind of have a good idea that you're onto, onto a winner. So for us, in kind of gauging how big we can go if there's an audience for it, it it's the perfect launch is a kind of a bigger mainstream festival if I the other thing let me just add about Sundance is it's the beginning of the year and particularly US distributors are desperate to outgun each other and so they you know they they come to that festival in extremely aggressive mode and and that's a great place to have your films Sorry, check open check <laughs> open check <checkbooks. laughs> um, in terms of again just thinking about um, 
the things like uh, sales agents, one of the things I've noticed, again, t in terms of when projects come to me, my heart slightly sinks if in the business plan, it's, again, no disrespect, TV sales agents do a fantastic job in their area, but if a documentary comes to me with a TV sales agent rather than a theatrical sales agent, again, it's, I just feel they're not going to have the right connections. So again, what kind of advice, when people are putting together their business plans for finance plans for, for a, a documentary, and if they really genuinely, you know, it's, it's, it's for them a theatrical thing, what are the things should they be, they be thinking about? Um, no, I absolutely agree, and the, the protagonist uh, is a sales company that, that sold Sugar Man and The Imposter, and we, we actually love working with them. Actually, you're acquiring their former yeah. chief executive yes. Yes. Uh, as head, head of the film fund at the BFI, which is um, sort of interesting um, in itself. And they, they, they have a kind of passion for films, right? And you know, they, they absolutely want to position your film in every respect in the marketplace. As, as a theatrical film, that is, that's what drives them. You know, uh, they aim to do all rights deals in each territory, which have, you know, potentially much more significant than doing TV only deals. Um, then pragmatic as well. They, you know, if, if those deals aren't available, they will sell to television. Hopefully, they will go to the television markets as well. Um, but you know, in, the, in their marketing and their just their sensibility and their approach to, to sales, um, yeah, it's all about theatrical. Uh, and the other thing I would say is that we usually, always actually, I always sort of uh, attach um, a US sales rep, which kind of performs a slightly different function, and it's usually, actually, if not always, Josh Braun from Submarine, who has become the sort of the, the absolute sort of rep par excellence for, for documentaries. Um, because, you know, there's just, he has an ability and a kind of facility and a kind of, uh, we, you know, in the American marketplace, and the Americans obviously all regard us as, 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 as foreigners, and, and, you know, actually having an American who, you know, who speaks their language, who understands their sensibility, who knows how to sell to them, can be and has been, in our case, uh, hugely helpful, and usually our international sales agents are more than happy to kind of partner on the sort of North American sale with someone like Josh, because they know Josh can bring real value. And John, do you have anything to add? Uh, I mean, I think I, there's nothing to add. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of films together, as you can tell, and we've worked, as Simon says, protagonists. It took a long time to find protagonists, I have to say, but it was a, a real pleasure to find a sales company that we felt that we could really work hand in hand with, who understood what it was we were trying to do, who... You know, there's a sort of there's there's a danger of a sales company speak, which is what you want to avoid. You know, you want just to you want to just feel that 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 you are working with people who, like I said, really understand what you're trying to do, are hell bent on on doing the best deals they can, understand what it is they've got in their hands to sell, and uh, and also Simon says the rep for for a U.S. deal, having a rep like Josh is is invaluable. And again, he's an incredibly easy guy to work with. You know. So, yeah, those are both very important relationships. Oli, now that you're getting involved in helping finance uh, documentary, what, what advice, again, would you give the audience in terms of constructing that theatrical finance plan? In terms of...? Well, you know, sales agents who've got experience with, um, with distributors, with festivals, that kind of where, where they can position it, again, in a big screen way. Yeah, I mean, I think that... The sales agent you choose is, is invaluable. I mean, in, the, in documentary, there's a lot of very traditional kind of TV traditionally led uh, sales agents. Um, Dog, uh, we're ourselves actually moving into the international arena, so we're kind of cherry picking six of the 15 films that we distribute in the UK each year, and kind of hoping that by giving it kind of a big UK launch, we can kind of help the film's theatrical potential overseas. Um, in terms of the films that we acquire, I mean. The biggest successes we've had, um, the, the most lucrative ones that we've managed to release, have been bought from sales agents who have a combination of fiction films and documentaries, and I think they kind of understand the theatrical marketplace better. So, um, yeah, choice of sales agent is key. Carol, in your yeah. experience, what, what could you add on to that? Well, we, we've got Charlotte Mickey from E1 as our international sales agent, and in fact, we, we wouldn't have got any money if we didn't have a sales agent. I mean, it is a requirement of getting money 
to say you're making the film. Well, uh, you know, because we went to Film 4 and the Film Council, we had to have a sales agent. So it's actually no one really wants to come on board because I think in, in some ways a lot of people would rather take something once it's finished so they can see the finished product, like go to Sundance and buy the hot piece. So, so right, yeah. take it before they Yeah, so we, 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 for Dreams of Life, we had to get someone early on, and it was quite difficult. So Charlotte Mickey, I mean, you'll know better than me all the names, because I forget names, but she has got, she's worked with a lot of kind of interesting and unusual directors, uh, 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 cinematic directors, so that was really good. And I think she really took a pun. And I think Dreams of Life was the sense of it might not have happened unless certain people like Doug Wolf and E1 just sort of said, all right, we'll go, we'll go with it. We'll go with, you know, because I know Ollie says he saw the treatment and thought, um, you know, it was a go thing. But as you know, it was really, really hard to get the money. It took us years, didn't it? Uh, and we had to go and shoot part of it in Ireland, although it was a London story, because of how difficult it was. And I, I think it's, I, I always, you know, like you were saying, it was quite, did, I, did I hear you right when you said it was a bit difficult with Man on Wire? Or have I but, to get a bit of the money? Or was oh, I? Yeah, no, it's definitely. You a see, because you know, yeah. you look at Man on Wire and you think, well, it's a dead cert, isn't it? You know, it's a dead cert, and so it's really weird because I think with Dreams of Life, people go, oh, yeah, well, that was obviously meant to be made, and you're like, you do not know how effing difficult it was, and how little kind of people thought it would exist in that world. I mean, I'm not talking about you. And, and, so you know. much could go wrong. Yeah, I mean, so much could point. go wrong, and it's like, have you got access to this person? And you're like. Well, if I ask them now, it might blow away. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. But, but for me, having, this, having Charlotte Mickey on for me, one and Dog Wolf on early was absolutely spectacular because it gave us a lot of confidence and it gave the people that, the financiers, that after all, they are giving you money, it gave them the confidence that that film would be disseminated to, to an audience, which, which it has been. Um, but, you know, Dog Wolf nor um, uh, Charlotte Mickey had any intervention. They didn't go, actually, I think there may be one point when Charlotte Mickey did say, if you had intertitles in this film, more people would see it and understand it. But, uh, but you know, that's sort of, so they're not interventionists, but it's, I think it's very crucial. It's probably a good time to o open the uh, questions to the floor. Um, as again, if you've got a question, wait for the mic to be handed to you. Um, so I'm going to ask for questions. There's a question there. Hi, I was just looking at the, uh, the numbers that you put up, which um, my arithmetic may be wrong, but it looks to me like uh, the film's gross in UK box office no more than 60,000 each, and that's the gross number. So if you take Dreams of a Life, which um, I think you said, Carol, is 500,000, could you just take us through, the step, you know, with not a vast amount of detail, but just a step by step of how you actually made the film? What do you, what do you mean, the, what the budget went to? How the, fi how the financing actually worked? Because, because those yeah. numbers would suggest that UK Box Office is actually a tiny part of the kind of funding uh, formula. Uh, so, so, how did the other pieces fall together and, and you know, sort of who contributed what? Yeah, I mean, I've. I've it's it's number it's number of films oh, yeah, and then the and the cumulative box that's, office. That's, in that's each year. a total, which averages, I guess, at around sixty per film. But there must be some that make a hell of a lot. So probably. I mean, Senna made you know it was bonkers, wasn't it? But um, but so do you mean like a budget breakdown of what what companies gave what or what I spent on? Five hundred thousand um, that you to, to yeah, cover well, your first, costs. Yeah, first first of all, it was. Um, First of all, War Warpex gave it some development money, uh, but then they didn't green light it, so later on you have to pay that back. Uh, but then we got some money for a private, a private financier in Ireland of 25,000, which the uh, Film Council matched. So with the 50,000, I managed to do initial interviews with some of the key people that then I was hoping would make people very, very interested. Uh, but it, it wasn't that easy. Uh, I, actually, Ireland were in first, the Irish Film Board were in first, 
because we had an Irish producer, and then the BFI came on and, and filmed four, but it was quite slow, and, and it was bits of money, and there was even more private finance, and because it was done in Ireland, there's like the Irish tax, for, you know, that where you recoup tax things, I don't really understand all that, but it was real bits and pieces, and it was about starting to make it without having all the finance in place. Uh, to try and prove that it, 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 you know, it was working and stuff. But, but in terms of the, uh, for me, a success is when a, a film uh, cover, like that would cover its costs. Uh, and I think it ultimately, with all the world thing and whatever, so it's not a Senna, but it's, I mean, I think it was Dog, Dogwell's biggest one, wasn't it? Second biggest one. Second biggest one. <laughs> Was that, what was the first one? Age of Stupid. Okay. Often well, there's, the there's non-recoupable but... money in there. There's TV license money. There's yeah. soft yeah. loans. You know, it's sort yeah. of a patchwork of money, some of which needs yeah. to be paid. Yeah, out, actually, we got a Channel 4. You get, like, 50,000 or something like that, which is... The way they basically then pre-bought it to, to broadcast. So you, but you're getting that up front, uh, which would always be more money than if they bought it after. As far as, you know... So it's just really piecing it together. Should have my producer here. That was a bit embarrassing, but it was quite accurate. <laughs> it was very accurate. <laughs> um, um, more questions? I like the way the money question goes to the director yeah. there. That was, that was cool. There's a hand there. <laughs> did well. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to dive in there? Um, sure. I mean, in complete honesty, the scale of documentaries that, that we, we handle at Dogworth, I mean, this isn't Senna, this isn't Man on Wire. And in complete honesty, often a theatrical re release is a loss leader. Um, but that's actually the same in fiction film and even quite big fiction films. So I think the illusion needs to be shattered that a cinema release kind of makes film uh, money's money for films. But what a theatrical release does allow, and especially with documentaries, and I think that's why we still push it, is it, it serves as a very good platform. But I think the future, and we're beginning to see it now, is windows being collapsed. I mean, traditionally in the UK, you had to have a 16-week, three-day window between cinema release and then DVD, and then another window before TV, etc. But increasingly so, you're seeing windows being collapsed because in the, in the modern age and the internet, as, as we all know, the consumer is king. So we need to let the consumer decide where, when, how they want to see a film. And I think this is incredibly important for documentaries because documentaries, I think audiences are loyal to the, to the genre and, and they're prepared to pay still. I think issues of piracy are kind of less of an issue for documentaries because I think the audience is, is more sympathetic to the, to the genre. Um, so I think increasingly so, you're going to see collapse windows, you're going to see day and date releases, you're going to see event releases where kind of We've done a few where there's like big satellite simulcast events, but at the same time a film could be made available um, on the internet, also physical DVDs for those people who still buy them. And I think that's very much the model that's coming through, not only for documentaries, but the general film landscape. Um, and also working more in collaboration with our filmmakers. Um, Age of Stupid was a, very much a kind of uh, a hybrid distribution model. Um, there was a kind of a buzzword about four or five years ago about self-distribution because everyone thought they could do it themselves and that was the way to do it. All distributors are evil, they take all the money. And I think what people didn't realise was that, one, that's not true, and two, the amount of work and expertise. And, and if you want to distribute, then sure, but it's going to take up all your time. So I think the key is really working, getting better deals with your distributor sales agents, looking at different splits, looking at kind of keeping their costs capped and all that kind of stuff. And then just looking at experiment, experimental ways to just get it out as widely as possible and kind of using social media, all these new techniques without having to rely on traditional expensive forms of advertising. And I think th this is exciting time for filmmakers, but I think it's wrong to dismiss the, the, the work of the industry as well. And I think it's about finding that kind of perfect marriage. 
John, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, I, I sort of agree with what Ollie said. We, we, uh, we certainly, um, I certainly go about making the films the way we always have and anticipate them being distributed the way they always have been. What changes are things like The Windows. You know, we made a film called Fire and Babylon, which we released theatrically, but then it came out on DVD three weeks later. There's the sort of, the goalposts are moving a bit in that respect and we'll move with them. But until, some, until the marketplace says to us, we're not theatrically releasing your films anymore or we are VODing them and, and showing that the numbers are really gonna work that way on day and date, you know, we will continue to, to go about it the way that we always have whilst being as flexible as we need to be. But I feel like, I feel like we're not there yet. The, the whole sort of, you've got to be releasing on the same day across all platforms, I don't think we're there yet. And I, my background originally was in distribution and I've had a life of filmmakers <laughs> telling distributors how crap they are at their jobs and it's just not true. You know, distribution is actually a wonderful thing to do. It's uh, often for us when we finish the film, getting involved with the distributor and the campaigns and the posters and the ads and how you release it is a, I find a really rewarding, really interesting. And it's, it is hard work, it costs money. And these guys do it because they're the experts at doing it. So we're still working hand in hand with all those people until someone tells us we shouldn't, couldn't, or don't need to. Simon, echo? Yeah, I mean, I sort of agree. You know, as a producer, uh, you know, I want to be spending my time producing, making films, and originating stories. I, I don't actually I just want to be going to every festival and market. Uh, I don't want to be, you know, releasing films. I, I, I you know, doesn't necessarily make the process easy always. Um, actually, in some ways, you sort of always think, and maybe it's wrong to think that uh, you could, probably is wrong to think that you could maybe do a better job yourself of distributing your film. You, you know, you'll give it more thought. You'll be more passionate. You, you understand the film. You, you, you thought about it for three years. Whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, they, I mean, we're working, for example, on Sugar Man with Sony Classics in the US, and regardless of, of, of what we may think about, you know, their campaign, there is no doubt that they've been doing it for a lot longer than we have, that they are much, you know, they're very successful, they've released films incredibly successfully, they'll spend money, they're, they're, they're actually about, about Sugar Man, they're absolutely passionate about it, and so you kind of feel, you know, that's, 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 that's the best. That's what you kind of aim for. I do not want to be doing it myself. But it's a hand-in-hand -hand approach, I think, as you were saying. Um, more questions? There's a question here. Hi, uh, this is more a question for Lizzie. Um, I completely agree with what you said at the beginning about the glory of the cathedral experience of the dark room in the 90 minutes. But um, you also said at the beginning about how BFI money can only go to theatrical documentaries. Well, it, can, it can only, because it's lottery funding sure. no, and one no, no, of the rules it. and regulations yes. is that theatrical is, is part of our thing. No, now, no. that is something that belongs to sort of, a, you know, 10 years ago. Yes. We're very aware that um, changing culture and changing yeah. changes, but I suppose... I, I, can I just finish the question? Yeah. It was, I mean, I, yeah. I know that's what the yeah. rules are. Yeah. I wasn't querying that. It's, I just was interested in your opinion about the role of public money in, in its... Um, pushing the culture of documentary. Because a lot of what you were saying, all of you at the beginning, was to do with theatrical documentaries different from telly because it's not format driven and it's more passionate and so on. And it would be lovely, I think, as a viewer, apart from anything else, if more of that could be smuggled into TV. No, I so I just wondered what the role of public funding globally, I'm not asking you to change yeah, the policy now yeah. today, I just would be interested in your views on where public money should be in terms of changing the culture of what can work in documentary where more people are actually watching it. I think it's very interesting that we get more applications now because of the change in climate in terms of what TV supports. In the old days of the BBC when, and, and Channel 4 when there was more essay-type documentaries supported, we're now getting those essay documentaries coming to us. And you know, rain, you know, great value, and I love documentary. I love it all in all its sort of forms and watch it all on all different ways. I'll watch it on my iPad and I'll watch it on the big screen. But it, it's, I think it's an interesting point because... You know, you know, rethink values of the old BBC. You know, that, that told stories in a particular way. Um, uh, you know, you, you think of some of the great documentaries that came out of, I know, the things that Pavel Pavlikovsky were, were making, where he was, you know, he went off for two years and came with something quite extraordinary. That doesn't happen in TV anymore, as I understand. I talked to but my. Then again, 
you know, it's interesting, isn't it, that, I mean, my background is in television, and, and yes, I kind of turned to feature docs, theatrical feature docs, because there was sort of paucity of funding for ambitious docs, but isn't it interesting that ITV are sort of putting out, you know, 52 up, I think yeah. Michael Apted's somewhere in the room, perhaps, um, you know, in the heart of their schedule, you know, a, a series that, that, you know, can only be delivered uh, uh, by, by, by television. It's kind of documentary in its purest and, and most ambitious form. And, and, and television is brilliant at uh, uh, delivering yeah. that. In fact, you know, Channel 4, uh, you know, one born every minute. I mean, that's kind of pure... But they're, but they're also happy to finance it. Because obviously, you know, 56 up is the derivative of seven... You know, it's, it's on and on. So there's a pattern and a format which I think has, has sort of frozen out innovation within within well, television and it's become it. factual and it's become constructed reality which i love but you know all that kind of stuff so i think the idea of what you're saying essay films all those kinds of films that had opportunities to get finance will not anymore it's very you know very very yeah. tough and the idea of smuggling them in would be amazing <laughs> just have a channel devoted to it <laughs> well, i think yeah. i mean I bet, but back to your point yeah. you know it's ultimately we're moving into an era and we you know we talk about content but you want content in an authored way. And I think that um, it's an interesting question to explore. And I think that the rise of foundations, um, you know, that are giving money to more, towards documentaries because they can see that you know, there, there's, an, there's, there's a need that's not being served. Um, and um, I think that sort of reflects again, sort of, uh, the, sort of the way things are shifting in terms of, of, of broadcasting and funding. Um, Ollie, what do you? You're reflecting, you're, you're nodding. In agreement, yeah. 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 Does that answer? I mean, it's, it's, we're, in a, we're in a very, we're in a, we're in a sort of, you know, as we know, we're in a Teutonic sh shifting time at the moment and, uh, you, know, you know, supporting what kinds of stories. I mean, if, if for a public fund, I'm very aware that if we started thinking about content, it would be, we'd be in, in, under such siege because there's a, you know, range of different stories, different lengths, all those sort of things. At the moment, there's these sort of ways of, thinking about it, which help contain the, the, the flood. And it is about things told in, you know, 70 minutes and above. But is it, isn't it interesting that the most successful feature doc of all time is an essay? You know, what Michael Moore I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, more, more questions? It's a question uh, right in the front. Just, yeah. um, this isn't, well, I guess it's kind of a question. Um, on a more positive note, um, <laughs> What are each one of you most excited about right now to do with theatrical docs? If you could sum it up. Just. Um, well, take it on. Sorry, that's a horrible question. Uh, I suppose the fact that we're still making them. Um, I run a company called Passion Pictures. We've been doing it for 14 years, and it's just, it is a real thrill to still be in the business of making feature docs. It's a real thrill that that there's an increasing audience for them, that we get to work with amazing filmmakers, tell extraordinary stories, you know, being both in Sundance and even last night, you know, when you see, when we see Rodriguez come up on stage and watch the audience reaction to that, there's, that's a reward that beats anything else anyone could be offering me. Certainly the idea that I get that buzz from doing my job is, is a, a real thrill. So, you know, we're busy, we're making a whole bunch of films that we're either producing or execing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess the fact that we're just still in business, is that an answer? I suppose it is. Um, for me, it's a genuine, a genuine belief that documentary is now honestly competing with feature films. And I think the fact that the, the, the entire scale of the industry, from universal working title all the way down to a small budget um, success like Dreams of a Life, across the whole spectrum of the industry, that documentary has been recognized as a, as a, as a theatrical proper genre, I think that's a wonderful thing. Well, I think as a punter <laughs> of it, I, do, I just really, ex you know, I just want to see lots of different stories told by lots of different kinds of people. And I think in documentary, there's a kind of, you know, I mean, you know, I've been watching, I, get, I try and get a lot of the free dog wolf films, you know, because... I'm in with them now, you know. But, um, but it's just like, it's exciting to see 
Because I, I, I guess for me, documentary as opposed to factual, I hate the word factual, I love the word documentary because it embraces so much different kinds of storytelling. So I love people that experiment with the way stories are told and I think the documentary tradition is of people from, you know, the guy that made, I forget what my name's now, anyway, uh, Sherman's March, uh, Ross McKelvey or however you pronounce it, but all these people, or, or Shirley Clark in America in the 60s who did Portrait of Jason and they worked for television they were even I don't know what they were for they, they, they just fucking made them you know what I mean and it's like for me that that's what gets me excited when I manage within this kind of very within the theatrical you know when you've got your American movies and it's all very closed down and it's a rom-com and it's this that and the other or maybe a kind of clever indie movie that's really financed by Hollywood and all that rubbish but like when you get to see stories that are told in a passionate way about something that that really matters to someone so do documentary is amazing and how people t tell them how people tell that story. And so, you know, obviously I saw The Imposter. I haven't seen Sugarman. I'm looking forward to that. But also, I mean, these, got, these two guys at the end are the elite, aren't they, of do the documentary world? So, I mean, they're making me feel a bit B-list. Actually, Z-list, anyway. But, but, you know, so I've never been in Sundance because they've always turned me down. But anyway, but I think that there are just, you know, by, I just think by any means possible. And when I see a film that someone's made by any means possible, I'm excited, whether it be a documentary or not. But I think documentary has a tradition of that because you could just go out with your camera and do it. Slightly. You know. Yeah, I, I guess it's sort of echoing something that you've said and you know what sort of excites me is the idea that we might one day be able to sort of break, or break down this idea that sort of documentary is a genre and actually you know it's just a form of, of telling stories. It's a sort of a means to an end rather than an end in itself and unfortunately this the, you know documentary just on, on the imposter, our distributors don't even don't want to use the word. They don't want to go near it. They don't want to position it as a documentary. So it was the same with Man on Wire, and that was because documentary is a dirty word. Uh, it's like subtitled. You know, <laughs> yeah, trying right. to sell a subtitled movie without, without showing it has subtitles. Yeah. yeah, but documentary, as you say, can be so many things. You know, it can be genre. It can be a thriller. It can be social action. It can it can deliver many different. And, and it's best, it can engage a cinema audience, in my view, like no other. And I think audiences, we need to continue to demonstrate that to audiences by being ambitious. There. More questions, that's a great way to sort of, sort of have a sort of semicolon, but I'm sure there's some more questions um, out there. Or do we leave it on that very positive, upbeat note? Um, I, think, I think it shows the vitality, the enduring vitality um, you know, there, there are always going to be those films that hit and, and hit, you know, in, in uh, the cathedral as, and, as well as the, the other spaces that you can play documentaries. But um, I'd like to thank the panel very much for their contributions and, um, and go out and see, see documentaries on the big screen at this festival. <laughs>